Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. As you can see today, I am rocking this luxurious beard. Uh, this is not the only beard I am rocking in my life at the moment, but she's great. Anyways, let's go ahead and get into the video. Today I am in a bit of a rush to get this one done before the first NBA Knicks game of the season starts. So today we're going to be talking about Kafka. Alrighty, let's get into it. So for starters, this is a paper that I recommend that all of you read, considering the popularity of Kafka, and also just how simple and short it is. It's only seven pages, and it's fairly easy to understand, especially if you've watched some of my Kafka videos on this channel. Anyways, Kafka is a paper out of LinkedIn in 2011. And basically, the gist of it is as follows. At the time, companies are generating tons of log data. And up to this point, most of the log data was handled offline. Maybe people would scrape the logs using some sort of batch job from each individual server. But this is starting to be infeasible because around this time, people are actually starting to use log data in production. And so basically, you know, like I mentioned in the past, this was just analytical. And so many of the systems that existed at companies were mainly used to just take all of this log data and flush it into Hadoop or S3 or something like that. And so basically what we need is to enable log processing in a few seconds. Now there are systems that do this at the time, right? There are all sorts of these message brokers like ActiveMQ and RabbitMQ, but for a variety of reasons that described in the paper, they just aren't good enough. Additionally, they want to make sure that their service is highly scalable, that it's able to support a ton of throughput because we are going to be creating tons and tons of log data, and also just that it has a relatively simple API. We just want to be able to produce messages and then have others consume them. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about how message brokers were before Kafka. So mainly here, I'm referring to things like ActiveMQ, RabbitMQ, other JMS implementations. So basically, for the most part, these brokers were not optimized for log processing. They were optimized for messages that were created, but probably not with neither the volume nor the amount of data that logs are created. And the reason that this is the case is because of a few different things. For one, these types of brokers support a really rich feature set, which is nice. However, it also makes them slower. They support things like transactional rights, right? They can go to multiple queues at once and they can be atomic. They also might maintain state so that we can acknowledge and remove messages after they're processed by every single consumer. In ActiveMQ, you can have topics. Uh, every single consumer can read the message from a topic and only after that's done will that message be removed. But now the broker has to be stateful and of course, storing things in memory means that we're actually just going to have a lot more to keep track of. It's going to complicate things and it's going to degrade performance. Number two is that up to this point at least, none of these brokers had a batch message production API. Uh, to reduce the amount of network overhead for publishing. Uh, number three is that there were a lot of headers per message just in the JMS specification. As a result, this would bloat the message size. Number four is that, like I mentioned before, if we have a slow consumer, we're not gonna acknowledge the message. We're storing more messages in memory and performance is degrading. Number five is that they are not trivial to partition. And number six is that even uh, the systems that aren't exactly message brokers and are made for log processing are generally running at a pretty large interval, right? Maybe minutes or hours, but they're not processing these messages on the scale of seconds. Okay, so now that we've cleared all of that up, let's go ahead and talk about the actual high level design of Kafka itself. Just like any other message broker, we've got a bunch of producers, and then we also, on the right over here, have some consumers too. So basically, every single message goes into a topic. We can write some amount of data into it, right? So I can write Jordan and hi over to topic A. And then on our Kafka broker, we can be storing partitions of every single topic. Then from our consumer, basically what we'll first do is read a given topic at a certain offset, read a some amount of bytes, and then afterwards add that byte total. So in this case, if we read 100 bytes, now instead of reading message 100, the next time around we'll read topic A from offset 200. So let's dive into that a little bit deeper. Basically, what does this actually look like on the broker? Well, for starters, I mentioned that Kafka does actually support a batch API of messaging, which is going to make our life a lot easier. Unlike ActiveMQ or RabbitMQ or something like that, when you write a log to Kafka, at least at the time of the paper, there was no way to get an acknowledgement back from the broker, which also speeds things up a little bit. When you first write a message, it goes into memory and is maintained in memory. Eventually, uh, what we maintain in memory gets a little bit too big, and we're going to eventually flush that out to a nice ordered log on disk. So you can see that as uh, you know the number of messages increases, the offset of each file increases. And what we'll do is we'll actually over here maintain a sparse mapping of the byte offset of each uh, message in a file 
to the actual file itself. So this is just going to make it a little bit faster. If I say, hey, I wanna read message 700 or message at offset 700, I can see, ooh, that is between 500 and 2000. I'll binary search this sparse index and say, okay, well, if 2000 is pointing here and 500 is pointing here, I know that I have to read in this file and that's going to make my life a little bit faster. So what do we actually do on the consumer side? Well, like I mentioned, or I was starting to mention in the previous slide, if we're a client, we basically cache our own offset that we last read from Kafka within a certain topic and a certain partition locally. And so basically we'll take an offset that we want to read. Maybe we want to start from 100. So we'll start over here. Maybe we read 100 bytes. And then from there, the next time we're going to read from offset 200. And so we can cache all of this information locally, which means that this Kafka broker is effectively completely stateless and we can restart it as needed. So let's get into a few more specific design details about this broker just to list them out. Number one, like I mentioned, we have this nice batch API to limit the amount of network bandwidth that we're using. Number two is that Kafka does not do any dedicated caching of files or messages of any sort on its own. It just employs the operating system cache. Now the operating system cache is pretty effective here because effectively, as long as we do write through caching, right? think of it as, you know, maybe we'll cache this whole file. Uh, it's not going to be very long before the consumer reads that. So as long as basically our operating system cache is slightly big enough and our consumer isn't lagging too far behind our producer, we know that the consumer is about to read messages that the producer creates and a write through cache should be very efficient. We can always use um, an LRU replacement policy if need be. Another thing that Kafka does is use something called kernel bypass. So basically the gist of this is when we're sending messages over the network to a particular consumer, Note that this requires multiple different times that you have to copy the message. You have to copy it from the application to, I believe, the kernel layer, and then the kernel layer to some sort of socket, and then you can send it over there. Now, if you can avoid copying it to the kernel layer, then you are going to speed yourself up a little bit, and this is just a nice optimization that Kafka is going to go ahead and do. And then finally, note that unlike other ActiveMQ or RabbitMQ brokers, as opposed to pushing messages to clients or to consumers, the consumer is actually going to pull it on its own interval, right? So this is going to enable us to do a couple of things. For starters, it means that we have no acknowledgements to actually remove a message. The consumer can pull a message and then it can go and wait for an hour and then pull another. It doesn't have to do so immediately. We don't have to send as many messages as necessary over to each consumer. <clears throat> what this means is that if we're not removing messages because they're processed by a consumer, what Kafka actually does instead is it sets a configurable retention period for every single topic or every single partition of each topic, and then that is going to allow us to eventually clear up space on our broker. In the meantime, we can actually go and replay old messages, which is really convenient if for some reason our consumer goes down or if we just want to check out certain data again. Now note that basically another nice thing about the poll based message approach is that if our consumer is falling up behind for some reason, we're not caching a bunch of in-flight messages waiting to be acknowledged, but rather basically this thing can just proceed at its own pace as long as it's able to do so before the end of the retention period of the messages. Another concept that I want to talk about in Kafka is known as consumer groups. So basically, consumer groups are a way of partitioning out our consumers so that we can actually read from every single partition uh, in a topic that we care about. And so basically, the nice thing about consumer groups is typically if we wanted to ensure that every consumer was reading each message only once, we would have to do a lot of coordination between each consumer, right? Because every single one would have to say, hey, I'm reading this particular message, you can't read it yourself, right? We've seen that in other uh, systems that we've talked about. For example, something like Photon, uh, you know, everyone's going to the ID registry every single time they're handing, handling an event, and that can really slow things down. On the contrary, in consumer groups, basically we're attempting to have minimal coordination between each process. And the way that we do that is by basically ensuring that per partition, we need to make sure that each partition is only being read by one consumer at a time in the consumer group. That way, if a consumer is assigned to a particular Kafka partition, it doesn't have to basically contend or compete with any other consumers to read it. It can do so without having to grab any sort of distributed lock. Note that Kafka topics themselves can be partitioned. I've already implied this, and the way that they're partitioned is either just like by doing so round robin, or you can set some sort of key per message and like a header, and then we'll actually do partitioning based on the value of that key.
Okay, so what does this actually look like in practice? Well, of course, we are going to have to have some sort of consensus involved here or some sort of coordination because ultimately, if one of these consumers goes down, someone has to replace it when reading a topic. So what does this look like? Up here on the left, we've got all of our different Kafka topic partitions. And then C1 and C2 are the two consumers that are part of a consumer group. So the way that they say that they're part of a consumer group is on startup, they go register themselves with Zookeeper. And so that's over here in step one, which, which consumers and which brokers exist. Another thing that Zookeeper store is which consumer is reading from which partition. And the last thing that Zookeeper is going to store is the last offset read per partition. So I'll cover number three in a little bit more, but for now, let's cover number two. When these guys register themselves to Zookeeper, they're gonna say, okay, I see that there are two different consumers in this consumer group. Since there are six total partitions, and there are two total consumers, C1 is going to grab the first three partitions and C2 is going to grab the next three partitions. Now you can note that one, having a lot more partitions is going to ensure that the load stays relatively balanced, right? If there were only two partitions and one of them happened to have a lot more messages than the other, one consumer might be doing quite a bit more work than the other. But by ensuring that we have a lot of relatively evenly distributed partitions, this thing is quite a bit easier to balance between the load. It would also just be tough, you know, if uh, you know the the number of partitions uh, or number of Kafka partitions and number of consumers didn't align very well. That would be rough. Like if there were six partitions and five consumers or something like that. So ideally, we always want a lot of Kafka partitions. So another thing that we do in Zookeeper is we register something known as a watch. Now I'm going to talk about these a lot more when we actually make a dedicated Zookeeper video. But think of a watch as just Every time that Zookeeper changes its data, it's going to notify both C1 and C2. Upon being notified, C1 and C2 are going to say, ooh, are there any more consumers? Are there any more partitions? If so, I need to recalculate which partitions I'm responsible for reading and then claim them again in Zookeeper. The last thing to note is we have this concept of a last offset read per partition. Every once in a while, as C1 is reading these guys, for example, it's going to come to Zookeeper and say, hey, here's the last offset that I read. The reason that happens is because let's say C1 goes down, someone else needs to take over reading for these three partitions. And when they do, they want to resume at the last offset that C1 was reading. Now, for what it's worth, since C1 is only updating that offset every few seconds or every few messages, it is possible that the new consumer that takes over for C1 may actually reread some, uh, re some messages from those partitions that C1 already handled. We basically have to be able to deal with that either by doing a two-phase commit, which is pretty inefficient, or we can use something like item potency keys, uh, or we can just deal with the fact that certain messages get read twice. So now I'm going to go ahead and write that all out, but really this entire slide is just repeating everything that I said, hopefully a little bit more concisely. Basically, every single time that we start up, all consumers and Kafka partitions are going to register themselves as ephemeral nodes in Zookeeper. An ephemeral node just means that, you know, if for some reason the consumer or the broker containing the partition goes down, that node is deleted. And because of the watch that we registered over here, everyone will be notified of the fact that that process went down. Number two is that every few messages that we read from a given Kafka partition, the consumer is going to report the last read message offset. This is going to ensure that if someone else has to take its place because the consumer goes down, we can start rereading from that offset. Now note that these offsets are persistent nodes, right? They're not tied to one particular consumer. We want those to stick around. Basically, this is going to mean that we can then resume from that offset if for some reason a different consumer begins to read from that topic. Again, like I mentioned, the offset can be a little bit stale, but if we are going to be replaying messages, ideally we don't want to use two-phase commit. It would be much better to derive some sort of key, like an item potency key, from every single message and then use that to deduplicate work. Finally, if Zookeeper changes, right? So if for whatever reason a new consumer gets added or a consumer gets removed, basically all of the consumers will be notified of this via the watch. And once they're notified, then they can recalculate which partitions they're responsible for listening to. So I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate that right now. So we've got Zookeeper right here, which basically says, okay, well, partition one is currently claimed by consumer one, and the last read offset is index 10. So we've got all of those entries for all six of these guys. So what's gonna happen? Let's say that consumer number three goes over here, and then it says, okay, I'm gonna join. 
And once it joins, it's gonna say, ooh, wait a second, there are six total partitions and I'm consumer three, so I'm going to be responsible for claiming these guys right here. So what we're gonna do is erase the fact that C2 has these guys claimed, and we're gonna say, hey, these are now consumer threes. And consumer three is going to start reading from offset 20 and offset 100. So now consumer three is reading here, and then consumer two is basically going to see via a watch, hey, wait a second, some of my partitions that I'm supposed to be reading have been claimed. Let me wait a few seconds, and then I'm gonna go back to Zookeeper, read the new configuration, and see which partitions I should be having. Okay, seems easy enough. I now realize that because I'm consumer two, I'm only responsible for partition three and partition four. So now we're gonna go ahead and set those up, and it's going to read from the corresponding offsets. This is now going to take a partition from consumer one, who is also being notified by the watch. Consumer one is gonna say, oh wait, there's six partitions and I'm consumer one out of three, meaning that I only am now responsible for the first two partitions. So I'm still going to keep my subscription to P1 and P2, and then I'm going to begin reading from those offsets that I already had. So this is basically how we can easily scale up the number of consumers that we have in a consumer group. So if there are a lot of different Kafka messages that are being published, we're able to be uh, reading all of them in a timely manner. The last thing that I wanna to touch about quickly before I end this video is Kafka in practice. So the authors of this paper gave a little bit more information about how they were running Kafka, at least when they first created it at LinkedIn. Number one is that basically per data center, they had a different Kafka cluster. Uh, and then per message, they also have uh, integrity checks, right? So these would be a checksum per message. Now this is something that Kafka does by default, but I also thought it was worth pointing it out because I hadn't covered it up until this point. Another thing that they do personally, just within LinkedIn, is they would have all of these metrics for the number of messages that were produced, as well as the number of messages that were consumed in order to compare them and ensure that their system wasn't buggy and dropping a ton of messages. Another thing to note is that as far as serialization of messages within the broker, they would tend to use Avro. Avro is really nice for schema evolution, and it's also just going to be a lot more efficient than JSON if we do have a predefined schema. This means that in order to keep message sizes small, rather than attaching the full schema with every single message, all we have to do is have some sort of centralized schema registry where every single schema is associated with a schema ID. We can then include the schema ID with every single message, and so each consumer is then able to look up the schema ID from the schema registry when it receives a certain message with a schema ID. It only has to do so once per schema ID because it can just cache the schemas after that as schemas are relatively small and they're also immutable. Finally, one more thing that LinkedIn did was they basically made it so that if you do have data on a Kafka broker, they'll also make that as a potential input for MapReduce jobs. The reason being that this allowed them to actually input that data into something like Hadoop really, really quickly, as opposed to needing a separate consumer for the entire Kafka queue, and then from there basically syncing that into uh, Hadoop. Uh, ultimately, I don't know if this is something that is used a lot these days, but I did think it was an interesting thing they were doing at the time. Okay, let's get into our conclusions quickly so I can go ahead and meet my friends. Basically, the gist here is that like many other systems, especially something that is common with NoSQL databases at the time, if we take out unnecessary features in our system, it can have really, really nice implications for our performance, right? Kafka is able to do better in the use case of log data specifically than typical JMS brokers. And so the reason that it's able to do so, just to go ahead and summarize them, is again, we don't support transactions. We don't need acknowledgements either on the producer nor the consumer front. Basically, we're able to publish many messages at a time to be produced in Kafka. We store the messages more efficiently, both via using Avro to store our messages rather than JSON, as well as having fewer headers per message. By using kernel bypass or the send file API, as they call it, we can get messages to consumers more quickly to increase our throughput of consumption. We can replay messages, which doesn't really increase our performance, but is really nice as a fault tolerance thing. And then also, as we showed via consumer groups, it's pretty easy to partition messages both within a broker and also partition out our consumers so that each message is consumed once. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Like I mentioned, it's a fairly simple paper, but I do think that because a lot of us work with Kafka directly, it's very, very useful to actually read. I recommend that you guys give it a shot and let me know if I missed anything. Anyways, have a good one and I will see you in the next one.